Um, perhaps just to say that I've had the opportunity to um, see and hear what Liam has to say um, uh, um, in terms of using the internet to try and keep up to date. In fact, only yesterday, Liam was on uh, uh, British Chambers of Commerce event and um, uh, has usually uh, some very useful things to say. So I think what we need to do is uh, move straight away to Liam's presentation um, and make the most of the time he's got with us. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Graham. And uh, hopefully my uh, screen is about to pop up and uh, yeah, and and uh, sh share my slides. Um, I, I, I did join just at the end of the last session and I can see from the chat the kind of flavour of questions coming through. So I'll try to uh, um, engineer the slides that I have and what I was going to say to the people in the room. And I can see from the program that you have, you've had a big focus on food exports in the in, in uh, this morning and uh, food and drink sector particularly. So uh, I'll kick off and uh, hopefully we'll have uh, 10 minutes at the end where we can deal with some questions, but do file them up onto the chat uh, area. I know there's already uh, some questions on there that I will come to, one from John Sheehan uh, that, that I'll come to as well on uh, on EUR ones and other things. So um, moving on uh, then, uh, the the thing uh, we, we're at, we're in this final countdown phase, aren't we, where we've got 29 days to go until the end of December. I know some people say we've got 30 days to go, but that's the 1st of January. And I can assure you, um, I will be not be working up here in Scotland. I will be doing other things on the 1st of January. And I urge you all to do the same because it might be the last opportunity you get to have some fun. Um, but uh, what are the issues at stake? Well, fish since seems still to be a big issue at stake between EU and GB. The Northern Ireland Protocol is still at the forefront of everyone's mind in terms of maintaining the peace in Northern Ireland, not having a physical border. And of course, there have been a number of uh, uh, um, uh, different solutions to uh, ensuring there is no hard border in Ireland, but also in making sure that both sides can respect uh, their, their, their sovereign, sovereignty in, in uh, making uh, arrangements so that goods can move freely, but also that they have uh, sovereign uh, power over the, the borders, wherever that border happens to be. The UK Internal Market Bill, of course, caused a lot of friction in the negotiations because uh, of uh, the impact that that would have in, in terms of the NI protocol. You'll have noticed there's been uh, a lot less discussion about the Internal Market Bill, despite it having uh, made its way through Parliament into the Lords been sent back again and of course by the end of the year we expect it may be passed but things are going a bit quieter on that at the moment it is controversial and we should remember that it is a fallback position in the event of no deal so it's part of the no deal uh, planning for the UK and the EU of course of this absolute desire uh, and requirement indeed to maintain what they call the level playing field and that impacts on things like state aid uh, and the arrangements that we uh, will have in, in, in the UK for state aid and our willingness at this stage uh, to share and commit to what those arrangements are as part of the EU deal. Um, so those are the issues at stake. The behaviours I uh, suggest you continue to keep an eye on, I've been repeating this in webinars over the last few months, is uh, watching the language, which is actually in the last four weeks, uh, three weeks probably, has become much more less confrontational, less confronting by either party. They both are making statements that are uh, uh, consistent with each other about the need to uh, continue talking um, uh, and so on, and that's good. Um, also note that uh, we no longer get a schedule sent to us of the uh, what's going to be talked about and when and by whom. Uh, um, this is all happening uh, on or, or in the dark, if you like. We're all in the dark about what's happening uh, in the broadest terms. We get to know um, where think that they are meeting and we see Barney arriving at St Pancras and we see David Frost going off uh, to uh, to Brussels and so on. We've also seen an increase in pace and frequency of meetings. They're very high. Uh, they work through weekends. Uh, so there's a desire to keep talking. And that's the, the important thing is actually to note that as long as people are talking, there's the potential for uh, uh, something good to come out of those those talks. Um, Actually, you know uh, that, that that that's a good a good thing for us to see 
on, on that. And also, compromise almost seems like an imminent thing uh, that's going to happen. That both sides will uh, are still working towards an agreement, and therefore, one would hope, and I certainly hope that politics, fear, and rhetoric are behind us, and that that's replaced now by pragmatism in both sides in the, the need to get a deal done, the need for our economies to benefit from a continued trade arrangement between the UK and, uh, and uh, the EU. I think interesting to note, though, that um, whilst this is all about free movement of goods, services, capital, and labour, that's the whole point of a, a deal and, uh, and, and having one, is that you know, we did a snap poll on our webinar yesterday, over 700 people responded to that SNAP poll and they gave us exactly the same result we'd had a month previously, um, which was that 58% of traders have carried out um, some kind of risk assessment on the changes to the border model. And, uh, and, and, and the, a similar number have taken at least one of the eight actions set out by Michael Gove back in August. Now that did not fill me with glee, I have to tell you. I, you know, I really hoped that that 58% number would have gone up to more like 70%. Um, two different polls, two different groups of people, but resu results are absolutely consistent. So we have got a readiness uh, uh, issue, if you like, with, uh, with, with traders and the work that they are doing to get ready um, for the change. This is likely to be very last minute if we get a deal at all. Um, I think it's looking more like we're going to have a deal because people are talking, uh, but don't be surprised if it's the 31st of December when they finally uh, reach the, uh, the compromises they need to reach in order that we get a deal through. What would that mean for business as well? I would hope that what it would mean is that whilst the, uh, uh, you know, the terms of an agreement are reached and the principles of the agreement are reached, that actually the principles are uh, also agreed that they should be deployed uh, immediately from uh, the 1st of January and the end of the transition period. So that, that the, the principles are applied and businesses can start to move goods on, uh, under those principles whilst it may take some months before the deal is fully ratified by member states and the like. Uh, worth noting that the member state, uh, leaders of member states are um, lined up, I believe, to come together on the 28th of December. Unusual that they would meet between Christmas and New Year, but that has been lined up as a meeting potentially in order that they can ratify or certainly uh, hear about uh, any deal and be able to give their um, uh, verbal assent at the, very, uh, at the very least. And we should remember many other deals have been operated in that way historically, right back to the Treaty of Rome, uh, where the principles are agreed, um, the, the, the deal is almost uh, fully enacted and the paperwork gets done, gets done later. Um, also worth noting uh, at this stage that for EU member states, the Brexit trade agreement is not their number one priority. Um, it, it, it was at one time, it's probably stopped being that. Uh, um, what comes number one priority, of course, is COVID and the impact of COVID, but also for EU member states, they're going through the negotiations right now on their budget, uh, 1.8 trillion budget and recovery package. Um, and they've got some troubles around Hungary and Poland who are uh, uh, you know, threatening to veto that, 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 uh, that package. And they've also got the EU presidency um, uh, election, if you like, uh, for that at the moment. Um, uh, lots and laws and migration, lots and budgets, and Brexit comes with somewhere down uh, that pile uh, in the EU. Um, so uh, I turn now to uh, our own government and our own government's preparedness. Well, we, we had this uh, uh, report from the National Audit Office last month uh, that was pretty scathing, actually, in terms of our government's readiness. And what they said was, we've got this big problem of 270 million customs declarations, potentially uh, an increase from the current 55 million, and we don't have the infrastructure in place to, to deal with that. Um, we've got uh, uh, somewhere between 40 and 70 percent of trucks heading towards Kent that are estimated not to be ready and unlikely to be ready uh, for the border. And we've got a government that spent 1.41 billion pounds on this readiness so far that the National Audit Office says is probably um, a big enough number, but they have, they've started spending it far too, far too late. Um, and the, 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 you know, the, the nub of all of this is that um, back in March, 
um, eight, eight of the nine key elements of the government and the border industry readiness uh, that was being monitored uh, were at, at risk of not being delivered by the 1st of January. Um, unfortunately, by the time we got to September and the NEO went back uh, to uh, the Cabinet Office on and the Border and Protocol Delivery Group to get a new assessment, they found that actually um, nothing had changed. Whilst the systems had been developed, they were still at risk of not being delivered by 1 January. Um, and that's not only in terms of uh, the systems and the infrastructure around that, there's the data movements around those, traders and haulier readiness, and also the capacity of customs agents to deliver on behalf of, uh, uh, of, of traders. And uh, so it's not just the systems uh, that are a problem. Um, uh, and actually the government, look out for the government talking much more about traders not having got themselves ready and blaming traders for not having got themselves ready rather than that the systems weren't ready for the traders to be able to learn the systems to be ready. So look out for that. I have a concern about that. And we certainly talk to government in those terms that they ought not to turn up and blame business for any problems they have at the border. It's systematic. And the delay in, in, in releasing those systems is in large part uh, the problem that traders face. Um, so what can traders actually do? Well, they can, you know, knowledge is power. I'm going to point now to some uh, uh, some uh, 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 subject matter that is all backed up by information online uh, for traders to go and access uh, right now. Uh, these are all hyperlinks, incidentally. When you get this presentation, you'll be able to click on the links and go directly to those locations. Bottom left, all HMRC documents. Helpfully, in some respects, HMRC are now publishing a domain on, web, on the web where all of the documents that they release will go on there and are on there. Um, helpfully, they're in date order. So the most recent documents are at the top of the list. Unhelpfully, there's now 24 pages of documents uh, that traders might have to look at. So it's an avalanche of information that you need to work through to find the item that you're looking for. I also, at this point, usually say, um, if you're looking for someone in gov.uk, use Google to find it because the gov.uk search engine, it uh, doesn't work, it's rubbish. Uh, it's a waste of time. So use Google in, instead. So I want to point you now to you know, information around contracts and cash flow. First thing is postpone VAT accounting for businesses that haven't yet signed up to or organized for or put their systems in place for postpone, postpone VAT accounting. You need to do that. If it's food and it's zero VAT, well, maybe that's less of an issue. But nonetheless, postpone VAT accounting, get, get your systems up to, uh, up to speed there so you account for import VAT in, the, uh, in your regular VAT return and you pay for that at that point. Second thing for import is duty deferment and guarantee waivers. Uh, that system went live 27th of November. If you have an existing deferment account, then uh, you can uh, ask to upgrade that to a, uh, with a guarantee waiver. So you don't need a bank bond or an insurance bond to secure that future customs debt. And if you're EU approved or, or have uh, SIVA approvement uh, or EPSS approvement, you'll automatically be given a guarantee waiver. So again, businesses can uh, uh, remove, uh, uh, you know, they can actually access the cash that may be set aside as a bond, uh, and they may be able to stop paying insurance premiums to a broker uh, for a, 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 a broker's bond, an insurance bond to cover future debt. So there's a saving uh, in, in there that helps cash flow and a future cash, cash flow help. Also, there's a link there to the tariffs from the 1st of January 21 and where to find them. This is the WTO tariff. So this assumes we have no deal with the EU and WTO tariffs apply. You'll find them on uh, under that link. Um, and you're able to go and look up the commodity codes that you are exporting uh, uh, to other countries and work out what those tariffs uh, will be in the event of no deal. There's also a link to Incoterms and how to apply them. And I know that Kent Chamber can help you if you need more knowledge on Incoterms. They will have courses that you can uh, uh, go on to understand uh, uh, what, what Incoterms are and what are best for you. But this is a, a consistent re request that we get from businesses of, uh, who are selling X works or delivering duty paid um, uh, about what they do about uh, their Incoterms going forward and how they handle imports and exports. Um, uh, this is the uh, slide that has the 11 incoterms that are available to businesses. 
and the chart on the right really describes the the, the, the point at which goods move, the title of goods moves between buyer and seller, and also the balance of uh, risks and responsibilities that businesses have. The most commonly used are X work. So I'm selling goods, I want to sell them X work so that I don't need to deal with any customs uh, formalities, or um, I, I've bought goods um, and I've, I've asked for them to be delivered duty paid again, so I don't need to deal with any customs formalities. Um, that, that, that's, that's great where the res responsibility lies on one party almost exclusively, uh, but it's not brilliant. If you're selling du delivered duty paid, that's not brilliant for you if you're selling into the EU and you may want to review your INCA terms and your contracts in order that you find a better balance between you as the seller and your buyer as the buyer, um, because your buyer typically will be in the country of import and therefore will more easily be able to deal with those formalities. I know previously on the call there was a discussion about uh, Eurotax and having uh, a global tax representative in the EU. That's also a way to, you know, uh, to deal with this. Uh, but but you uh, you need to appoint someone as your global tax representative to handle the fiscal elements in that uh, uh, second country that you're moving the goods to. Uh, and there's a link there uh, for you for you to look at and so on. Uh, it, it, the, the, the next slide is, uh, I call it, it's never simple. Well, this is because we've got what the government would describe as staged, uh, a staged approach to full import um, uh, and uh, uh, declarations between January and June next year. Important to stress that this is for imports from EU only um, and, uh, and not from the rest of the world. Uh, but it is never simple. Uh, what this really means is that you can, uh, you, you, there's a link there to the stage introduction of EU imports and, and the second link is entry and declarant records. So this is where for imports from the EU, you will be able to simply record in your own uh, files and your own system uh, uh, the information relating to those goods that you have imported between the period of January and June next year. Uh, in order that you do that, you also need to be taking account of uh, the VAT elements uh, and using postponed bad accounting. Um, and you also need to have a the, the duty deferment account in place at the point at which the final phase of that process takes place, which is the submission of a supplementary declaration. And you have up to 175 days after the import uh, to, 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 to have to do that. Um, typically, businesses we're dealing with are um, uh, making entry and declarant records for the period January to June. And then their intention is to make a single supplementary declaration for those goods um, in July of next year. You can do that, or you can do the 175 days afterwards, take that approach. But this is simply for, uh, only for uh, goods being imported from European Union, but is a big cash flow booster because whilst you're going to account for the duty element, uh, sorry, for the VAT element in your uh, regular VAT return, uh, the duty element will not be uh, come due until the point one seven five days later. So that's a positive thing uh, for um, for for businesses in that regard. Next few slides, I'm not going to say much about um, uh, the the detail is there on what records you would need to keep. Um, I want to kind of move on and give a chance uh, for you to uh, to deal with some of your your questions and so on. Uh, this is the detail on uh, what EIDR looks like and the records that you must retain. And there's some links to explainers on, on things like customs procedure codes. One to watch out is number six, customs value. That's not invoice value. That's different to invoice value. And you need to understand what a customs valuation is because that will determine your duty, for example, uh, that becomes due in the VAT that becomes due. And, you know, I've come across lots of companies that get tripped up by this, where they, for example, buy goods uh, from China at very low cost and they sell them at very high margin. Um, uh, so the customs valuation uh, is not simply the invoice cost there. It can be, uh, but you might have to justify why the margins are so great. Um, the uh, next two slides, what we don't know, well, clearly we don't know the terms of a UK EU agreement. So that means, for example, uh, going back to John's question in the chat, um, we don't know if we require an EUR1 for goods moving from UK into the EU, because we don't know the terms of the agreement. In the event there is no deal, then uh, uh, we won't be using EUR1s because they're, they're only used where there are prefer preferential arrangements in place through a free trade agreement. 
And, and so in those circumstances, some companies in the EU would require a certificate of origin, but some simply wouldn't. They wouldn't require them because they're going to consume the goods in the EU and, and, and they're, not a, they're not a requirement. You can make in that case an invoice declaration of origin, but the buyer of your goods will have a responsibility uh, uh, there to be sure about the uh, origin in the event that they then sell those goods on. So we don't know the terms of that, which means we don't know quite a lot about how we're going to trade with uh, the rest of the EU. Um, we still don't know on those continuity trade agreements that haven't been signed yet or agreed yet for places like Mexico, um, Egypt, Turkey. We don't know the terms of the agreements uh, that, that will apply there beyond WTO as a fallback position. And big thing we don't know because it's subject to the UK EU agreement is goods going between GB, NI and NIGB, um, uh, how we'll handle them. We know, we know the systems we're going to use. Um, you've already got a link to the Trader Support Service. So if you have goods moving to NI, I, I really urge you to sign up for the Trader Support Service. But there's, there's going to be gaps, if you like, in, 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 uh, in, in there. Um, the other slides uh, here, uh, uh, what, oh, sorry, finally, what traders don't know. These are the four things that traders ask us most about. And most of that information is available and as far as it can be available on the government website. So you have all the links uh, to that there. Um, other slides that you'll find in this pack are really just informative slides on basic things like, you know, the gap in the availability of uh, um, customs agents and the like. And I'd urge you, if you need a customs agent, a broker to clear goods in or out of the UK, talk to Kent and Victor Chamber of Commerce. Conscious of time, I know we started a little bit late, but I'm going to stop there in order that we have time to come to questions, Graham. Thank you, Liam. Um, we uh, perhaps Molly, you could um, well. Firstly, uh, apologies, Molly, because we were messaging each other, and um, uh, but I hadn't switched my camera on, and I was sitting in front of the computer, but you didn't re realise I was there, which uh, shows that I'm still a baby where IT is concerned. Okay. Um, but perhaps you could just confirm how long we've got, cause, because uh, we don't have that long. I realise. That's okay. Um, so the next first in Mike Whitting is on at uh, 20 to 12. Uh, so we've just got about right. five minutes or so. Okay. In that case, uh, let me let me look at the question that's in the chat from Ellen, Ellen to everyone. I have a question on free issued items. She goes on to say we are, sorry, just nearly lost it there. We are we have free issued items from EU currently and expect this will continue into 2021. Will we have to be the importer of record? And if so, uh, don't we don't do ever own duty? the item? Do we own, do we account for duty costs? Can we okay. use a processing relief system? Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's a fairly complex question to, uh, well, it, well, I'll take, take it on the basis of when people talk about free issue items, often the mean is that the goods have no value in terms of invoicing. Um, I'm, I'm afraid that when it comes to a customs valuation, they do have a value. So um, you, you, they, they have to be valued on the basis of what would they be worth in this country. They may be free issue to you, but what, what do you do with them and what's the inherent value in those goods? So yes, you would become the importer of record uh, typically um, and you would have uh, uh, duties to pay. You're right, though, there, there could be a way of, um, uh, you know, using uh, inward processing uh, uh, authorization in order that the, so if, if you bring them in as free issue, you call it free issue, and you then process them into some finished goods that are later sold on the market in the UK, then the customs value would change to be the value on the market in the UK or thereabouts. You need some expert help in this, I think, specific to your business. Uh, and, and, or the customs value, then they're re-exported uh, and uh, the re-export takes care of that. But yeah, that's a fairly complex question that I need to uh, put, put myself or, an, or one of my colleagues on to, to answering. But um, yeah, it's, it's yeah. probably a good idea to get that bottomed out right now, Ellen, uh, rather than uh, be dealing with that later. Thanks, Liam. I, I understand, uh, Ellen. And Ellen, just to clarify, uh, there's our contact details um, in the chat already. Um, it, it clearly was complex. And what I didn't want to do was ignore it because it was complex. Um, 
what it, uh, what it does bring into focus is the value and the importance of, of the basic document, the commercial invoice, which can show that there's no charge, but can also show the declaration, which is, uh, are free of charge, but value for customers' purposes is whatever figure uh, is declared. There was another question that that, um, that was cropped up a few times, how, uh, which was from Darren Smith originally. Uh, how will long-term supplier declarations to customers in EU change? Well, I, I, again, we don't even know if LTSDs will be part of the future arrangements with the EU because that would all be contained within uh, the, the, the agreement. So they're about trust between parties, aren't they? And um, uh, so... We, we don't really know the answer to that question uh, as, as as yet. Um, I, I, I mean, what I would say to any business is, as long as you have a, a long-term declaration in place and uh, nothing substantially changes in in in, in that, um, I would continue to, um, you know, perhaps continue to issue it to my to my uh, um, customers until in the absence of any other information, but. Um, I expect that will be part of the agreement uh, going forward that they have some validity with customs authorities uh, on both sides. Um, yeah, there's, there's also a question. Sorry. Sorry. No, go on. You've, um, you, you, you're going to read the question yourself, so go on. Well, uh, Nancy asked, what is the meaning of declarant? Well, that, that's really simple to answer. The, the declarant is the person who has fiscal responsibility for the goods. Um, and, you know, a, a, a customs declaration is a fiscal document that can, you know, carries with a, a significant liabilities if you uh, get those things wrong. Um, anything from, you know, an audit from HMRC through to um, uh, fines and imprisonment. So uh, it, it matters as much as tax uh, and your tax return. Uh, yet uh, it would be fair to say that they've not always been treated in that way by businesses uh, moving goods uh, into and out of the UK. Uh, I think that's been a bit unfair. We've not had to worry about them because we haven't had to make them. So they don't seem to be that se you know, serious. We haven't had to make them for goods moving between UK and, and the EU. Um, and I, I was going to come to the question uh, that uh, uh, Paul, Paul Kinnear asked. They, they're, they're moving people in ambulances and private ambulances. Clearly, there's a number of issues that, that uh, uh, could affect uh, uh, Paul and the movement of people who are unwell. Uh, uh, between uh, and, and across uh, borders that could be, uh, um, you know, could be blockaded because of, uh, uh, you know, uh, issues around there uh, that happen at the borders, particularly through the the, the short streets and the like. Um, there will be issues about drivers and uh, visas and green cards and insurance and mobile roaming that will either be resolved by a trade deal with the EU. Um, or if they are not, then you need to go to the existing. There is uh, uh, guidance on gov.uk um, in the event of no deal that would uh, broadly apply um, uh, um, uh, in the event of no deal on 1st of January that's on gov.uk website. So I'd refer you, I know it's like, go and look at gov.uk. Well, to be honest, that's where most of the knowledge is, unless you h hire someone as a consultant expert to give you advice, I, I'm afraid it's going to be gov.uk or wherever you can find it on the net. I think we've uh, we, we've probably uh, strayed over into the uh, 11, 11 40 plus uh, yeah. time zone. Molly, Mo um, Molly's itching to move on and I, and I understand that Molly. Yeah. So uh, I'll say thanks to everyone for their attention and, uh, and giving me the opportunity to come on this. Thanks to Tudor and to Graham and Molly and, uh, and Joe and the rest of the team at, at Kent. Um, uh, they are available and can access uh, myself and colleagues for uh, specific matters and, and we'll do our best to, to help you where we can. Uh, but good luck from the 1st of January. We'll need a, a bundle of that. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but as ever, your chamber is here to uh, do what we can to help keep, keep trade flowing, keep businesses uh, economically powerful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Liam. Liam and Graham both, thank you very much indeed. Uh, always a delight to have such expertise um, with us. And we're, we're really, really pleased that, that you've done so much work on this, Liam, uh, you and you and Emmanuel. 
uh, tremendous. So, uh, yeah, thank you very much indeed on behalf of all the Kent businesses. Thank you. I'll drop off now. Thanks, Tudor. Speak soon. Thank you. Thank you. Graham, thank you very much indeed for uh, for hosting that for us. It's very kind. Um, so we're moving on to the, the next session now. Um, so we're going to be looking a little bit more about uh, sort of Kent uh, as a business community and as an economy and uh, and how we're going to see uh, see things through over the next few months uh, where obviously uh, we're going to have some direct impact. We are the closest land mass to the mainland EU and therefore, you know, we are very much at the, uh, the gateway to, to all of this uh, transition ending. Um, it's a delight uh, that I can now introduce you to uh, uh, Mike Whiting, who is the Cabinet Member for Economic Development at Kent County Council. Um, Mike, thank you very much for joining us. Um, before we move into uh, the more detailed uh, conversation around keeping Kent moving and some of the support, uh, I'd just like to invite Mike to say a few words and to uh, talk to us a little bit about how the Kent economy is going to stand up to all of this. <laughs> That's quite an introduction. Thank you, Tudor. <laughs> and uh, thanks for that. And thank, thanks again to everybody at the Kent Chamber, uh, the Kent and Victor Chamber of Commerce, in staging this uh, excellent event. I've managed to hear quite a lot this morning, and I think the, the speakers and the information that's uh, that's being put out there is really, really helpful. Um, I wanted first, if I may, just to reaffirm to you as Kent and Medway businesses uh, that our, our commitment at Kent County Council to continue to do all that we can to provide support and to provide support for you both through the COVID pandemic and of course through EU transition. Kent has already uh, been badly hit by COVID. Um, it's estimated the county's economy will shrink by some 12% this year and that will be reflected in unemployment rates which are expected to triple across Kent and Medway. Uh, particularly badly hit as we know has been uh, the hospitality and leisure sectors with pubs and restaurants who've been so creative in reopening in a safe way during the summer, um, receiving that double whammy under new tier three arrangements that come into force today. Uh, government has supported businesses forced to close by law uh, with over 300 million pound paid in grants since the first lockdown. And I pay tribute to Medway and our district council partners in distributing those grants. And I must also congratulate the Kent and Medway uh, Growth Hubs, uh, Growth Hubs COVID-19 Business Helpline, um, which I'll now call the Business Helpline, um, but it run by the Chamber and supported uh, by KCC with district partners. It's been, it's taken a huge uh, volume of calls and provided expert advice and assistance at a time of huge worry and anxiety for many businesses, um, many business men, men and many business women. Unsurprisingly, of course, the hospitality sector has been one of the major users of that helpline. And, I, and I'm delighted that um, KCC Roger Goff, KCC's leader Roger Goff confirmed our further support this morning and, and extending the helpline until the end of March next year. I was also delighted Roger was able to confirm the extension of our Kent and Medway business funds to provide additional interest-free loans to businesses to help them grow post-transition. As a response to the pandemic, we set aside a further £6 million for interest-free loans, and we're getting that money out of the door, helping businesses to create new jobs and safeguard existing ones, including in the hospitality sector, which, as I say, has been so badly hit. Um, a further way, important way um, we are supporting businesses is by working with the government to stimulate the economy through new construction and investment projects here in the county. Uh, you may recall at the end of June, the Prime Minister announced a new deal which put jobs and infrastructure at the centre of the government's economic growth strategy. I think his famous phrase was, we will build, 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 uh, build back better, build back greener and build back faster. And to do that um, at pace. And we're putting that into action here in Kent. As part of the new deal announcement, Kent was successful in securing £37 million pounds from the government's Getting Building Fund to support Kent seven key infrastructure schemes across Kent and Midway. Um, and with these projects now coming on stream, we want to ensure that Kent business benefits from the supply chain and construction opportunities. Over 600 construction jobs are expected to be created in the county as a result. Uh, one of those projects will increase digital connectivity in rural areas 
as we know, increasingly, almost everything that we do requires a mobile or broadband connection. And the pandemic has amplified the need for good connections as tens of thousands in the county uh, started to work from home. Our digital connectivity project will top up, uh, will provide a top up voucher to the existing uh, rural gigabyte scheme funded by government and be delivered by BD UK. Uh, this will mean that residents and businesses in the hardest to reach areas will be able to get a voucher worth up to £7,000 each and then communities can pull those vouchers to improve their local broadband connectivity. Uh, we're also supporting further uh, major investment opportunities by promoting Kent's case for a free port at Dover, bringing new investment and jobs. Uh, we are promoting a £30 million accelerated uh, medicines design and development project at Discovery Park in Sandwich to create a stronger cluster of commercial activity using advanced digital technology and supporting the Kent, uh, Growing Kent and Medway, a world-class uh, leading project based at East Morning Research Centre to promote the adoption of the latest horticultural technologies. And I congratulate the team there on recently gaining a further £17 million of government investment in that incredibly exciting uh, project. And we're working with our international partners to encourage trade and cooperation through uh, the Straits Committee, a new initiative linking KCC and the channel facing local authorities from Zealand in the Netherlands through East and West Flanders in Belgium uh, to the Nor and the Pas de Calais in France. KCC has a, a long history of formal ties with neighbouring authorities across the channel and we also have a track record of cross-border initiatives to support trade, tourism, cutting-edge research, research and innovation that have been built up around strong partnerships working with colleagues across the Straits. Just over a year ago, I and the leader of KCC invited our neighbouring continental authorities to come to County Hall to discuss our cross-channel relations after the UK's withdrawal from the EU. And what was very clear was we shared the same concerns, be it ensuring our businesses can continue to trade, keeping our economies open, open uh, retaining border fluidity and creating opportunities for our areas, areas particularly uh, for our young people. We shared the same concerns. And to, but to respond to the change in circumstances, we felt we needed to put our relations on a more formal footing. So the idea of the Straits Committee was launched in February this year with the backing of the Foreign Office and the Cabinet Office. It's a voluntary partnership where we and neighbouring authorities come together to regularly, regularly discuss challenges and opportunities to see where we could make a difference by working together. Uh, the Straits Committee, I hope, exemplifies how we will use all available channels at our disposal to help Kent adapt to the new arrangements and manage any impact that relate to our shared border. Uh, we're looking forward to see how and where this partnership can add value to the efforts on the ground to prepare business and keep our borders flowing smoothly. Um, I'm delighted that we're also promoting the government's time is running out campaign to prepare and signpost businesses uh, to advice and support of which this event of course is part. Uh, my priority has always been to, Kent, uh, to keep Kent open for business and open for its residents and yesterday was a milestone when KCC and our public sector partners working together through the Kent Resilience Forum published transport plans aimed at keeping Kent moving and preventing and minimising the impact of cross-channel disruption on both the community and on business. I'm very pleased uh, to be able to introduce uh, several speakers, all of whom will tell you more in a moment of the practical support they are providing to help business and key sectors prepare and grow in the new post-transition post trading environment. Uh, Steve Sampson will outline services available to Kent companies covering all aspects of export and international trade through the Kent International Business Programme. Sue Birdo will highlight the extension to the Growth Hub services and the Kent and Medway Business Loan Funds. And the Chief Executives of Locating Kent, Produced in Kent and Visit Kent uh, will outline their support for producers, 
investors and that all important visitor economy uh, and kicking off uh, that session and taking us through all of the traffic management plans will be Toby Howe, who has been leading KCC's transport planning for EU transition. Um, I hope that's helpful, but first, Tudor, before we introduce uh, uh, that uh, triumvirate of people, perhaps um, I'm very pleased to take any, any questions. Mike, thank you very much indeed for, for giving up your time and, and for giving us a summary uh, of what is going to be clearly going to be a comprehensive uh, package of support, uh, and we look forward to hearing from the other speakers going forward. Um, one of the things that uh, was cropped up in, in the question so far was we're hearing a lot about um, the Northern Powerhouse and the levelling up agenda, but obviously when it comes to sort of the EU transition, as I highlighted, we are very much on the front line, literally, with Europe and the impact potentially. Do you feel that we're getting enough support from from central government and and what are you doing to sort of make sure that they are uh, mindful of the challenges we face uniquely here in kent yeah uh, it, it is a challenge um but uh, we are we i think are rising to it and uh, with our partners also uh, in the southeast local enterprise partnership in in um, essex and east sussex i certainly have bilaterals with essex on on a regular basis um and have discussed this is a really important issue for us that we don't kind of get left behind in the way that you just described uh, but we are that we're, we're not just a gateway to europe we um, are the gateway to the rest of the world um uh, via particularly the, the, the channel ports um that is a case we make um time and time again in letters to government um there have been numerous uh, visits um by government ministers uh, over the course of the last uh, nine months to kent um, and they, they, they continue to engage with us. Um, and we continue to ensure that Kent um, is at the top of their, at the top of their in-tray every morning when they get to work. And I think um, there are some extraordinarily good relationships building up um, in government and particularly at the officer level with the, uh, with the, um, the, the guys in Whitehall um, who, uh, under, uh, who do understand uh, the issues we have. And I think that's exemplified really by, I, I heard a speaker say earlier that uh, the audit uh, I think it was, was it the audit office have said, you know, there, there probably is enough money in the kitty now, but we're spending it a little bit late. Um, I, I, I would tend to agree with that, um, but the government is now uh, stepping up and providing uh, that the funds and the infrastructure that we um, believe we're going to need uh, to keep to keep Kent um, moving mm. and not just become one one major big lorry park come uh, come first of January. Which, which is actually an interesting point because again one of the questions which which may be for toby in more detail i'm sure he can sort of put minds at rest but famously we remember the uh, the the operation stack um now project rock uh, a couple of years ago which, which sort of brought kent's economy to its knees but the biggest concern i think we had was around uh, the message going out far and wide that kent was closed you know we couldn't get through uh, have you taken steps or are there plans afoot already to sort of try and head that that potential perception off yeah, one, one of our big asks, and I'm sure Toby will go into this later, but one of our big asks of um, government uh, was uh, a, what's become known as the Kent Access Pass. You know, what we don't want is lorries turning up in Kent uh, that, that can't, um, in quick order, get themselves mm. on board a ship or on board uh, one of the trains from, uh, from Folkestone. Um, and government have taken that very seriously and are, are putting in the, uh, the, the necessary measures. I, I say I'll leave it to Toby to go through the detail of that. Um, but I, but I, I, government have taken that very seriously and it's certainly been a, um, one of is the drum that we have been banging loud and hard uh, for, for the last two years. In, in a way, we're lucky in Kent because we do have um, the, we have the people who are putting together these plans lived through that those 31 days whatever it was of operation yeah. stack and understand that understand where the rat ones are that people try to use understand mm. how the fluid you know how, how, how the fluid mechanics of it work in a sense or, or um, and and that's oh, no, been no, no, really, sorry that's been yeah. really helpful in coming forward uh, with the plans that uh, that toby and his colleagues uh, uh, ac across the county and with government have formed as part of the Operation Brock solution. Absolutely, and that's that's really encouraging to hear. I think, as as obviously we have a, a premises in Ashford, and I live in Maidstone. So um, many a time back then, I found myself directing traffic in some country lane, trying to sort of have a, a standoff between. We had twenty five queued, they had five queued. Therefore, we win. They have to back up. 
So I hope yeah. we won't have any of those situations again. <laughs> well, I hope we won't. And, and, and you'll recall that, uh, that it was a mantra of the former leader, um, Sir Paul Carter, mm. um, you know, that we've got to keep the, we've got to keep the Queen's Highway open. Um, an operation stack effectively closes um, part of the Queen's Highway. Um, and uh, we've, we've um, moved on from that. We've also got uh, the, the, the threats around closing the M26 uh, uh, as well. That was uh, another uh, key component of the discussions with government. Um, so, um, we, you know, wait until Toby will he be explaining the plans. I think he's got some maps as well. So hopefully he'll uh, take that in more detail. And we've got some questions coming in for Toby already. There's just one um, which has been come, uh, which just references a point you made earlier about the broadband and it's from James here I uh, was just asking about the the push for mobile coverage which is still quite poor in, in certain areas we're quite rural and obviously they, there's some tremendous dead spots um, and of course with 5G being sort of a potential solution to a lot of connectivity uh, what, what's what's sort of happening on that front as far as the sort of mobile uh, connectivity side? Well, it, it, it's kind of all, all part of the same plan. We've just got another two and a half million pounds, I think it was, from government mm -hmm. uh, to try to accelerate some of these schemes. Uh, so we'll be looking at the round of the best connect, the best way of connecting uh, those not spots, to use the dreadful word, but those not spots around the county, and yes. there are there are many of them. Um, we are hoping that uh, the, the voucher scheme that I just talked about will bring another just close to a thousand um, really hard to reach play, properties. Um, online, if it's if it's better to do that via mobile connectivity, um, then of course that 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 becomes part of uh, that mix. But the, the team will be looking at projects um, for for both types of connection, be they fibre or um, by mobile. That's great. And there's just a couple of quick uh, one more question we're going to take, and then we'll move into uh, to sort of uh, to Toby's uh, session, which was just around um, the infrastructure projects we're talking about. There's two that have been flagged up. One is uh, Manston, the airport, what do we know about that? Is that going to push ahead now? Do you think that's a good time? And perhaps commercialising Ramsgate as a commercial port. We were just talking about access to, to the rest of the world. Are either of those two things on your agenda and, and where are we now? Well, of course, they're, they're not KCC uh, projects as such. The owners of Manston have got, you know, uh, they will certainly out their planning commission with, with government and moving that forward uh, in, in the way that they see fit. We're, we're there um, to support um, whatever activity um, happens there, if we can get commercial activity in that part of East Kent, I, I, I you know, certainly would support that as we're supporting uh, Discovery Park um, in, in their bids for um, bids for finance. Um, I'm not quite sure where we are with the Ramsgate. Um, that's more of a question for Senate District Council who, who own uh, the site. Um, but certainly if we can create more capacity or there is more capacity uh, to cross the channel, uh, in, in the future, uh, then that I think uh, can only be a good thing, but we have other ports as well, um, up on the Thames and of course at Sheerness. So there are a number of, uh, num number of opportunities to increase uh, the uh, traffic going out um, via, via the sea. Um, so your last point was on the... Uh, so Manson, so it was on the commercialization of Ramsgate port. Oh yeah, Again, sorry, yeah. I think uh, same, uh, same yeah, question. I yeah, yeah. Um, of course, there's, there's other there's other big things you know we're looking at uh, we're looking mm -hmm. at but they're sort of are sitting on the horizon. Um, ma massive opportunities possibly um, from the London Resort up at Swanscombe uh, mm -hmm. near Gravesend. Uh, so there's there's some big pipe and and, and big projects like the uh, the um, the third Thames crossing, yeah. you know, which is going to create thousands of jobs. Um, mm -hmm. And our challenge really, and we're doing it through an employability task force that has been set up. Um, our challenge is trying to ensure that we can see these big projects coming down, we can see that pipeline of projects coming down, and that we can uh, try working with the colleges, working with the universities, working with schools, ensure that um, Kent, uh, there is a Kent work workforce able to take up those, mm. uh, those new jobs, um, rather than importing them from other parts of, of the country. Absolutely. Uh, Kent, Kent solutions to Kent problems. Fantastic. Indeed, indeed. Mike, thank you very much indeed for your time this, this morning. Uh, it's been really valuable and it's great to hear that, that so much is, is being sort of prepared and planned and, and we look forward to hearing from, from the various speakers now as we move forward. But, but for now, Mike, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Um, okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to now hand over to uh, President uh, of the Chamber, uh, Richard Lavender, who is going to be your host uh, for the next session. So, Richard, hand over to you.
Okay, thank you very much indeed, Tudor, and and also um, very much, very many thanks to to Mike there. Um, can I say that um, welcome to everybody who's staying on for the next sessions. Um, should be an exciting couple of sessions that I'm doing for you. My name is Richard Lavender, and I am the president of the Chamber of Commerce. Been for many, many years, so the name's been kicked around. Most probably the first time you see me on screen for some time. So I'd like to um, first of all. Um, Welcome, Toby. If I can see Toby, where he is on the screen yet? Um, Molly, has he? Is he on the screen at the moment? Oh yeah, um, I can't see him at the moment. Um, sometimes people come in under different names. So, Toby, if you are here, please do feel free to unmute yourself. Please put your hand up. <laughs> If not, it's going to be an, an exciting, um, it should be an exciting um, bit regarding the transport planning. As you know, we are right in the middle of everything here and being in Ashford as well, we're really in the centre or the epicentre of, um, of the future storm that we're not particularly looking forward to. So um, um, I'm sure that Toby will have all the necessary paperwork um, and uh, plans um, still not showed his head as yet. Tudor, were you aware of Toby? Uh, I can't see him either. So um, what we'll do, we'll let Molly just uh, get on the blower, find out what's going yeah. on whilst you and I, because I know one of the things that uh, has cropped up specific <coughs> questions here for uh, for Toby were, um, one of them was around uh, DEFRA, uh, are building this enormous, uh, I think it's an inland border uh, post. Um, border control post. Yes. Yeah, which is which is. Uh, I mean, I think if animal checks and other bits and pieces. Uh, can you just sort of share what you know about that, if anything at all? Because I know you've been involved slightly. Yes. Okay. Well, as as you all know, the the, the massive great project that's happening out here at Sevington on the Junction Ten A. Mm -hmm. um, opens up and begins on January the 1st, irrespective of whether um, we use the the Waterbrook Lorry Park or whether we use Sevington, it will start on January the 1st. And um, um, I think it will be with the um, with MAFRA first so that we've got um, we've got the animal and fresh produce meat productions and things like that going through that will be checked straight away. And then later on in six months time, we will then have the other um, border control services operating um, from Sevington. It's a massive project. However, everybody says that Kent is going to come to a standstill. If we, I'm not an exporter or an importer, but if I was, I would be making sure I've got my paperwork well and truly ready by mm. now so that I didn't have to come into Ashford. And I would hope that Ashford would be one of those stops whereby if you get pulled for a check, then fine, in you go. But the thought of having 1,700 lorries in here at any one time is rather frightening. But I think that the um, those small areas will be ironed out when people get used to doing it. It's the change. And I do believe that the change that we've got is a massive change, but it's for the good. And it's all going over to IT. Um, and let's face it, we've all had to come on to Zoom and change. So why can't the lorry drivers and the exporters and importers go on to the computer and, and change? So, Absolutely. Um, yeah, and I think um, I was watching a, a, a future uh, innovation program the other day around uh sort of trying to prepare the uk's highways for um for fully automated vehicles you know self-guiding vehicles so i guess um potentially that that's all part of the mix going forward really so it'll be interesting to see how it unfolds well i certainly hope regarding the uh the, the automatically controlled vehicles will have the lower thames crossing open by then that'll give us three lanes in each direction what happens to the automatic bit when they get to Whitfield? I'm not quite sure, but um, I'm sure it'd be able to filter them down into one lane. I, um, I think I think yeah, Dover have been uh, ch championing that that cause for quite a long time. Hopefully, they'll uh, they'll be bumped up the priority list fairly soon. Excellent. Okay, um, let's just check in. Or oh, Molly's offline, so she's probably doing her homework. So I'm um, just looking at the agenda here. We have uh, Steve Sampson, Sue Birdo, uh, Flautia from producing Kent, Gavin from locating Kent, and Deirdre. Now I'm just going to have a quick look through. We might need to bring some of those presentations forward uh, in order to sort of cover for 
Toby whilst we try and track him down to see if he has any connection issues. Um, so, any... It would be rather ironic, Tudor, if he's caught up in a traffic jam, wouldn't it? Um, it... <laughs> especially being from traffic planning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll wait and see. Um, Gavin, you're, 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 one of our, you're in the window there. I can see, you, uh, see you've been attentive uh, throughout. So thank you very much indeed for joining us ahead of your time. Um, would you be happy to move across to, to your slot at this time? Sure, Tudor. That's um, great. Brilliant. Um, in which case, Richard, I'll hand over to you to facilitate this. I've, I've done the padding long enough. I'll jump out of the way and uh, I'll let you pick it up from there. Lovely. Well, thanks very much indeed, then, Tudor. Um, I'll give you an emergency call. You're only t up the corridor from me when if I get into trouble. But um, welcome, um, Gavin. Um, Chief Executive, locating Kent, um, support of investment into Kent. Um, Perhaps you, um, now that you've introduced yourself, or rather, if you introduce yourself, we can um, perhaps have your um, part of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. And um, huge compliments to Tudor, Joe and team on a really excellent event this morning. It's been really informative and it's great to have got some actual concrete information, um, which I think um, is not always the case, uh, but I, I feel that I've learned a lot this morning. So thank you very much for putting on such a good event. Um, so, uh, and Richard, yes, I, I'm, I'm Chief Exec of the of Locate in Kent. We are the official inward investment agency for Kent. We do three things. We uh, help to attract uh, foreign direct investment. Secondly, we work to attract domestic inward investment, and that's primarily businesses relocating from other parts of the UK. But thirdly, and perhaps most relevant today, we provide a range of business support services to companies seeking to grow, to internationalize, and, and most importantly, to, uh, to employ people. So, so, so we're very much measured on job creation. So I think I've only got five minutes, so I'll, I'll try and get uh, straight <laughs> to the point. Um, we have longer. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have had a very busy, busy uh, eight months, nine months, whatever it is. I, it's, it's so hard to remember um, during the, the COVID-19 crisis. So we, we, we have had um, that very much front and center of our minds. But at the same time, we're very conscious of the end of the transition period, uh, and, and as a result, have been doing a, taking a number of steps to make sure that Kent and Medway are are um, as are positioned as uh, in in a, in a strong a place as possible to 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 pick up on um, the potential opportunities for the end of the transition period. So, just as a few concrete examples, we at the beginning of. October, we commissioned a new lead generation agency, um, particularly focused on foreign, uh, well, with foreign direct investment, but also domestic immigrant investment. And they are focusing on West Coast USA, on India, on relocations within the UK. But I think most importantly, given the topic of today, that they're, they're really putting a heavy focus on Western Europe. So, so they're doing lead generation work in France, in Belgium, well, in the Benelux, in Scandinavia. And we have um, happily uh, have a number of live leads at the moment um, for companies that are looking to have a UK presence in the post-transition environment. So um, Richard, as you quite rightly said, everyone has been doing everything online for quite some time. Um, but I think it, there comes a stage when um, selling on becomes a challenge and you do need to have boots on the ground. So, so we do have a number of live leads of companies that, that need to have a UK presence um, post transition period. And, and actually that also applies to um, post COVID-19. So um, as you may be aware, American companies in particular are very reticent um, to allow business travel in the coming years. And, and, and that's what we, that's the guidance we're getting. So, so they're also looking to have physical presence on the ground um, here in the UK and, and, and ideally in Kent. So, so that, that has been quite um, a, a successful campaign, but, but the, what we've been doing um, and what's keeping my team um, busiest at the moment, we, we launched a new program in September called Future Forward, um, which you'll you get details of on the website. Uh, and Future Forward, as part of um, our service offer, we provide 12 hours worth of free consultancy to businesses that are looking to grow and internationalize. That is actually partly driven by um, Locate in Kent is co-funded 
from the European Regional Development Fund. So, and, and that funding has been um, has been reconfirmed until 2023. But what that's allowed us to do is provide the 12 hours of consultancy service, which it previously a lot of the focus was on manufacturing, lean process optimization. But we've changed that offer to include advice on funding, on marketing communications. Uh, on uh, being agile and pivoting your business. And uh, over the last nine months, it has been reacting uh, and getting on the front foot dealing with COVID-19, but we very much see those kind of, um, those kind of, uh, of, of services being of value to companies that are, that are seeking to, um, to, to adapt what they do around um, uh, to deal with the, the end of the transition period. And we do actually have a webinar tomorrow uh, on Future Forward that, that describes what it does and gives you some case studies. I mean, we, we've we've pretty much we've been inundated with requests for companies who want this, this this service, and it's not delivered by us. It's delivered by consultants and experts in their field, people like Crest and Reeves, people like Azets, uh, as well as uh, um, specialists in their field uh, in, in marketing communications, in in finance. So so that's been really successful to the point where we've actually had to close it uh, because we're we don't have capacity to do it will, it will reopen again in a year so i think what we're what we're very much seeing is that companies are in a position where given what they've gone through over the last nine months they are quite weary um and i, and I know that that very much from a chamber perspective richard and tudor you, you are very much on the front line i think think just the final message or note from me is that we uh it's been really great to work very closely with the chamber with Visit Kent, with Produced in Kent. So, so we um, we are part funded by Kent County Council, by Medway, the EU, uh, but also by a range of private sector supporters. But one of the things I've, I've really been very pleased about is how well the various agencies in Kent uh, and the Chamber have worked together to, to support businesses in this time of crisis. So uh, I, I'm cautiously optimistic for the new year. Okay, well, thanks very much indeed for that then, Gavin. I, I understand that uh, we still haven't got hold of, um, of um, uh, Tony, Toby yet, but um, Susan, um, was it Susan, is going to, to try and um, fill the gap now for us. And um, Susan, if I can hand over to you. You can. There you go. Can you see? Yeah. Uh, we can, but you need to yeah, presenter mode and then you'll be good. That's it. That's Great. It. All good. Thank you. So I, I usually work alongside Tudor um, uh, on all things Growth Hub and um, business support, whether it be financial or non financial. Mike Whiten has already mentioned the work of the Growth Hub, and I'm going to provide you with a brief description of its purpose and its offering. So by way of a bit of background, um, the Growth Hubs are a national initiative um, that are central government funded. Their purpose is to act as a type of one-stop shop for businesses to identify any necessary interventions and coordinate any new initiatives, um, either locally or nationally. Um, the whole purpose of that, in theory, is to um, result in a, a reduction of duplication and provide much more better value uh, for money for the, the service um, being delivered. The Kent and Medway Growth Hub is delivered by Kent and Victor Chamber of Commerce um, under contract with Kent County Council. So to give you an idea of the service offering, um, anyone that's telephoning the uh, Growth Hub will be met by um, a, a navigator from one of the um, team, um, either a navigator and or a business advisor. And information is imparted um, to the business with regard to what is available um, and you're guided to the right support that's pertinent to your business. There is also an information website which details all the funding streams, the training and the localised support programmes. Uh, included in the website is also a free events listing page 
and the hub delivers email alerts on funding, support mechanisms and government schemes. Now, I know Mike alluded to the business recovery helpline. Um, that was um, that is an additional service to the Growth Hub, which has been funded um, by Kent County Council, along with all the other districts of Kent. Um, and the helpline is offering free one to one advice with a business advisor. It's providing support to delivery to, to de develop a recovery plan. Um, and the website also has a free listing on the support hub. So that's like a community hub where lots of businesses have put um, their offering. Um, if any webinars have been um, done and delivered, they're uploaded onto that support hub so that they can be looked at thereafter. Now, currently, the um, support line, the recovery line is um, operational until the 31st of December. But as you've heard today, we are currently looking at the support requirements for January to March to ensure that we have an extension in place to the end of this financial year. So that's the growth hub. And that's just um, a visual with regard to um, everything that you can access via the Growth Hub. So there's grants and loans. You can advertise space within your business. There's face-to-face -face advice, obviously, um, perhaps now um, in this um, format. Um, there's obviously the website, which is informative, and there's advice and guidance on all things tax orientated. I'm going to now speak about um, the loan funds. Um, so I sit within the business investment team within economic development within Kent County Council, and we're responsible for um, a loan program, a couple of loan programs, the Innovation Investment Loan and the Kent and Medway Business Fund. Now, currently, we have no loan funds open because we, as Mike alluded to, we had a set aside a six million pot of funding um, to address issues around um, for businesses around the pandemic. Um, and we're currently in the cycle of um, uh, having back to back contract negotiation meetings with all those successful businesses that secured loan funding. But with regard to the funds that will be launching soon, the, there's the Innovation Investment Loan, um, and that will be um, offering loans of 250 up to 990K, um, where there is a match funding element required. Um, again, most of these loan funds, the, the purpose and the objective is boost to boost the economy. So it must create or secure jobs. Um, they'll, currently, we're looking at some focus areas around health and social care, tech, ICT, creative and cultural, marine ports, pharmaceuticals, logistics and development. And if there are any questions around that loan programme, um, I can put in the chat or send to Tudor um, the links to the bespoke KCC web pages. But for anyone that wants to... Um, uh, send a question in, um, I've put the email box there. Um, then there is the Kent and Medway Business Fund, and that is um, the re that uses the recycled funds for those of you that may have been around when we had Expansion East Kent, Tiger, and the Escalate loan funding. The Kent and Medway Business Fund was regional growth fund funding, which we put out under those three bespoke programmes that covered the entirety of Kent. And the money that um, is being, um, uh, you know, uh, put out for businesses to um, uh, apply for is the recycled funds from, from those previous loans. So the Kent and Medway Business Fund will provide loans between 101k and 500k. So again, it, it requires a match funding element. It must secure, um, create and secure employment. It's got to probably lead to some kind of growth or innovation. Um, so they are the ones that we hope we will be able to um, come on board early early next year, if not in the remainder of this financial year, but certainly um, from April 2021. 
We're, we also go back to the Investment Advisory Board on the 11th of December to review phase one of the two bespoke loan funds for COVID-19 um, to look at um, what went well, what, what didn't, and, and to revise the guidance notes. Um, I can't tell you now what the second phase will look like, but I can give you a flavour of what the first phase provided. Um, there were two bespoke loan funds. One was the K KMBF Capital Growth Loan, and that provided loans of 50 to 100K, and there was no match funding element required. And that loan was to support capital investment, and it had to protect and secure um, existing jobs, um, and um, there was an element of job creation as well. But, but predominantly, we were expecting more protection than creation. Having said that, we have got quite a few projects where um, the majority of the projects supported um, didn't just protect jobs, they created them. And then the KMBF recovery loan, again, providing loans of 50 to 100K, no match funding. But this is the very first time that our loan funds have supported working capital. Um, and again, there was an element uh, to create and secure employment there. Um, that's all I've got to say now with regard to um, any of the loan funds that will be la launching soon. Um, I'll know more after the 11th um, and that will probably be my job after uh, uh, during Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> OK, Susan, well, thank you very, very much for that. Um, we've had one or two other IT problems um, and I went off air for a bit. I believe that we're going to have Toby later on. Um, but at the moment, we're going to Steve. Steve, will, are you there? I am indeed. Hi. Ah, hi, Steve. Well, if you'd like to just introduce yourself, Trade Development Manager from KCC, and then perhaps do your presentation. Yeah, thanks no problem much. at all. No, thanks, Richard. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm yeah part of the economic development team uh, at Kent County Council, uh, and among several different roles, one of my main um, focal points is on uh, how we can help uh, Kent businesses to export. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of the support that's out there um, in the county. Um, and I will attempt now to do the um, fatal thing of sharing my screen. Let's hope that all works. So perhaps someone could nod um, when they can see that. So hopefully. Yeah, you're good. Excellent. Perfect. That's fantastic. Good. OK, so um, yeah, so just just a little run through, really. Um, and I think just to say, first of all, that obviously, um, you know, there's there's a lot of issues going on, particularly at the moment around transition, but that that Kent International Business is something that we've uh, had in place for a while uh, and that will remain in place. So it's not not just uh, specific to, to EU transition and dealing with some of those immediate uh, questions and uh, issues that businesses uh, find themselves facing at the moment. So uh, just a little word about Kent International Business. So you'll see on the slide there, there's a website um, and you'll see a list, uh, sort of a, a group of logos, which is basically um, all of the, the, the main public sector organisations um, in Kent uh, and also uh, HSBC, they're representing um, the pre professional service uh, organisations in the county as well. Now, we've been working together for, for a number of years um, and we we'll sort of meet regularly. Uh, that, and our main objective is to ensure that the right support is available to Kent companies that need help with any uh, aspects or all, indeed all aspects of international trade so whether that's from uh, market insight and market research through to um, finding and identifying partners uh, in, in an international market through to you know making sure that everything's compliant um, getting paid uh, after sales etc etc so um, yeah the, the, these are so most of most of the services are offered by these organizations are free of charge and obviously at the moment there is uh, a strong emphasis on uh, making sure that we are sharing information that we have available uh, around EU transition and helping companies uh, to understand some of those changes uh, that need to take place. Um, even if, let's say, not everything is uh, completely clear for, for even us as a group of uh, organisations yet, um, we're still waiting for clarity, as you know, on some uh, or a number of issues. But um, 
uh, certainly if we if we don't know um, you know we can uh, do our best to, to find a, a suitable answer for you um, so I'll just uh, skip to the next slide okay so um, yeah so in, I guess in terms of today's webinar and and where people might be coming from um, uh, this morning or this afternoon in particular uh, there's a few I guess things that, that might be helpful in the short term so uh, I guess one of the main uh, info points is the the government website on transition which is basically where the Department for International Trade um, would uh, keep most of the the up-to-date information about changes uh, legislation rules procedures etc um, and there's also um, it's probably been mentioned already but there, there is quite a helpful questionnaire on gov.uk forward slash transition where you can uh, put a few questions in about yourself and your your business uh, and it will come up with a list of recommended actions <laughs> that you might need to start thinking about um, um, putting in place um, so there's a couple of links there um, and I think a few practical things that you can do so you may well if you're exporting already uh, to the EU you, you're more than likely um, involved with the Department of International Trade uh, or indeed with Kent and Victor Chamber or Enterprise Europe Network so I would suggest uh, a, a chat with your international trade advisor would be a very wise thing to do at the moment um, because they're dealing with uh, various companies in, in Kent and often um, I think as, as came up in the first session this morning uh, it's unlikely that you're the only business uh, facing that particular issue um, and there's actually quite a wealth of resources uh, in terms of recorded webinars from the Department for International Trade in particular. Uh, some are very specific in terms of a sector focus. So, uh, you know, we covered uh, food and drink this morning, but there, there's other other sort of sector web webinars that have been recorded that are available. Um, and there's quite a lot of useful guidance online. And I think as well, just to, to, to flag up um, the chamber already, uh, which has been mentioned this morning um, has you know a wealth of expertise in terms of export docs and customs declarations so you know many of you may already be um, exporting uh, outside the EU uh, and we think a lot of the processes that you'll need to follow to then continue to export within the EU um, are similar so um, but they're certainly they've been you know finger on the pulse and keeping an eye on things so um, are an excellent source of information on that um, and I think once things kind of settle down um, if, if I mean I think we can't really talk about new normal in terms of Brexit I think we're only allowed to do that for pandemic but um, we've actually got quite a good network of international contacts um, some of whom spoke earlier um, at the conference uh, during the first session whereby um, if, if you have a, a query relating to a particular international market uh, we, we've got good connections particularly just across the channel uh, through Kent County Council Strait Initi Straits Initiative and through our ISE project so we've got um, you know active links with the Chambers of Commerce in, in nearby Europe uh, our colleagues in Enterprise Europe Network have got around about 400 um, in-market contacts across every EU member state um, boost for health project we've got uh, uh, contacts with, with life science clusters across Europe um, and of course the Department for International Trade um, has overseas posts in pretty much every country in the world who can adv help advise with specific um, queries and of course I should just mention the International Chamber Network as well so Kent and Victor is very much part of that um, and again uh, there's a friendly person on the other end of a phone or an email um, should you encounter a particular um, issue in, in, a, in a particular geographical market. And I think finally, just to say, yeah, that there's a lot of business usual as support out there. So I won't go into this. I won't go through the slide in great detail. There's, um, you know, information is available on the Kent International Business website. But just to say that, you know, if, if you're if you're new to exporting or if you're uh, an experienced export exporter with, you know, facing a lot of the new challenges that we're coming up against with um, with with transition, then you know, there's a lot of services and a lot of support out there. Most of it's free of charge. Um, to, to help you. So um, yeah, details uh, are on kentinternationalbusiness.co.uk and uh, my contact details are there if anyone wants to drop me a line and I can certainly uh, be delighted to put you in touch with uh, the most appropriate Kent International Business Partner Organisation in Kent. So I think that's it from me. Thank you. Oh, okay, well thanks very much indeed for that Steve. That's uh, very enlightening and uh, very in-depth. So thank you for that. Um, uh, next, I've, um, we're, we've altered the schedule slightly, but um, Florjad Hoti from um, from um, locate sorry from produced in Kent, 
um, is going to be our next speaker. So, um, Lodjet, are you on the screen so far? Yes, I am, Richard. Thank you very much. Oh, um, right. I found you. Thank you. <laughs> right here. I'm going to also, I, I did share a slide with uh, Molly. I don't know if that was received in time to include. Um, yes, I think Molly's found that. Um, I don't know if that can be brought up. Um, whilst that is being done, I can um, um, very quickly explain who we are and what we do and how we help um, the businesses that we rep represent. Uh, so who, we, who are we? We are a membership organization representing, promoting and supporting the local independent food and drink industry in Kent since 2005. And we promote um, uh, and support local food and drink to residents, visitors and businesses. We are a community and active network of local independent food and drink entrepreneurs who share information, expertise on and collaborate in growing, producing, selling, preparing and serving the best food and drink Kent has to offer. And we are also a dedicated team with in-depth knowledge of and experience with the Kent food and drink landscape. So how do we help our members and the wider food and drink sector in Kent? We provide online and offline promotion of local and sustainable food and drink across Kent and beyond to help drive sales of our members and of the, uh, of the wider food and drink sector in Kent through campaigns, events and partnerships. Uh, we do that through our website, our good news bulletins, which go out every two weeks um, to a wide customer audience and through extensive social media activity. Uh, during COVID uh, in, the, in the past year, we've been very active through our Help Can Buy Local campaign, uh, our Support Your Local campaign, which we did in, in collaboration with Visit Kent. And those two campaigns are now combined in the Buy Local South East campaign, which runs across East um, Sussex and Essex. Uh, we run campaign with other corporate uh, partners, such as Southeastern Rail at the moment. We work closely with other sector support organizations in Kent, such as Visit Kent, Locating Kent, and cross market each other's activities and programs. We sit on the Food from England um, forum, which is newly established to beat a drum on local food and drink nationally and internationally. Um, and we um, promote through events. Obviously, there was no activity in 2020, but for 2021, we're looking at the Taste of Kent um, Awards and we're looking to have that uh, organized as usual, a physical event um, in, in spring of, of the new year. Then, uh, in addition to our promotional activities, we give advice, signposts to available support and guidance, and we provide a one-stop shop for information and resources on any food and drink related issues. Lately, in particular, of course, on the EU transition and, and COVID-19 throughout the last year. And we do that again through our website, uh, regular updates, but also through weekly member bulletins with all the latest updates. So any, any information that people need, they can find quite easily through, through these two channels. We work in partnership with local government, trading standards, UK DIT, DEFRA, business and sector support organizations such as the NFU, FSB, Visit Kent, Locating Kent, and industry partners, uh, professional service providers uh, in, in all sorts of areas to get the latest sector updates and collaborate where possible on business support activities that help food and drink businesses get through the EU transition period, but also out the other end of the pandemic. So lately we have, for example, been running a couple of transition workshops with trading standards and UK DIT. And we have ongoing workshops, Q&A session and mentoring sessions uh, on all sorts of topics that will help uh, our businesses, but also the wider food and drink sector um, grow and, 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 and improve their trade amongst others online. That's, that's one of our, our main focus. I'd like to... Um, Mention in particular our emphasis on sustainable operations uh, that we are very much putting in place going forward, um, especially trading with EU post transition. UK businesses will have to stand out from their EU competitors, and we think that operating sustainably offers a clear USP and opens doors to funding and investment. Uh, and it also often saves cost, and of course, it helps in our battle to protect our increasingly fragile environment. So we are asking all our members and partners to subscribe to our sustainability pledge. And we're also rolling out an action plan to help our members become more sustainable operationally and showcase all the amazing work that they're doing already because uh, food and drink businesses 
very often are already working uh, in quite sustainable, amazing ways. Um, so we need to shout about that a little bit louder. Um, I don't know if the, um, the slide has come up, but the um, slide includes a link to a DEFRA digital guide for food and drink businesses. I don't know if that was mentioned in earlier sessions, but we have found that quite useful. Uh, I'm willing to, um, to share that link as well in the in a message uh, section. Uh, it's kind of a compilation of um, uh, all the regulations that food and drink base businesses in particular need to adhere to uh, from the 1st of January onwards. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Okay, Flodji, thank you very much indeed um, for that. Um, I didn't realise you were quite so involved there. So it's, um, yeah, it's quite a wide scope there that you've got. Um, okay, we've, um, we're going on now on to Deirdre. Um, Deirdre, are you available in there? I'm here, yes. Oh, you're, yes, you're over on my right. Sorry yeah. about that. Um, okay, Deirdre, Chief Executive from, um, sorry, uh, Deirdre, I'll go back. Yeah, Chief Executive from Visit Kent. Um, support for Kent tourism and the visitor economy. So if I hand over to you now, um, and just to let you know that there is a um, video being played afterwards, after Deirdre's um, had her little chat, and we will go on to that um, at a later stage. So Deirdre, over to you. Thank you very much, Richard, and good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to also share my screen, so hopefully um, you will be able to see this in a second so I can have a thumbs up from somebody if they could see it please yes excellent thank you um so I'm just going to um just touch on a few key stats around um you know the particular concerns around Brexit you know worries opportunities and obviously the most important thing is what Visit Kent can do to help the tourism and hospitality businesses out there who are probably having um, the most anus or horribleness of anuses that you could possibly have. Um, but just before I do that, I just wanted to cover off, um, you know, I think one of the only positives of, of this year is the fact that I think if you didn't know the tourism and hospitality was really important, you do now. But I just wanted to give you some just some key stats for Kent. So normally on a normal year, we would get about 65 million visitors. Um, and just under uh, four billion pounds would go into the Kent economy. But the really important stat is the one on the right, um, which is the number of jobs that we support. Um, in, in a few weeks, as in possibly even next week, we're about to launch our 2019 full year figures, which will have hit and exceeded all of those top line uh, numbers um, and have taken our jobs up to 81,000, which is fantastic news to see where we were um, and hopefully somewhere where we'll get back to. But of course, the figures for this year will be pretty much about half of, of that. So really important just to, to note how important the tourism and visitor economy is for Kent. And of course, you know, this is not just about um, people coming to Kent, it's people going through Kent. And as we've been hearing earlier, um, our channel crossing is one of the world's busiest crossings with 22 million passengers annually, 4 million cars, 130,000 coaches. Um, and normally, um, in a normal year, we are England's second busiest cruise port. Of course, all of that business is on hold at the moment. And as I say, of those 65 million visitors that we get every year who are coming just to, to visit Kent, the vast, vast majority are day trippers and they're either coming from elsewhere in Kent or they're coming from London. So keeping the county moving in terms of going out, coming in and moving around the county is vital. The other thing that's really important to note is our international visitors coming in. Um, very, uh, um, traditionally, we have a very strong um, educational travel uh, business, so uh, cities like Canterbury do incredibly well out of educational visits from the near continent, um, and getting that business back up and running as soon as possible is really vital for a lot of our, um, our businesses. So the things in terms of the challenges for, for, for our industry um, in relation to Brexit, I mean, there is a concern if things don't go well, that this is another shock um, to an industry that is already struggling. Um, when Operation Stack happened a few years ago, 70% of our tourism businesses were affected and there was a loss of about 40 million pounds. So we need to get this right. 
um, if our businesses are not going to have a further uh, catastrophic shock um, after a terrible year. Um, in addition to just um, can people come and visit, um, can places be accessed? There is an issue around supply chain. So um, as Florsha very eloquently put, you know, the, the, the dependence on um, our local businesses, on local supply chain is really important and really part of our sustainable destination message. Um, but actually many, many of our businesses rely on supply chains which come up coming from much further afield. So making sure they're not disrupted is really critical. And of course, there's been lots of talk this morning about that perception about Kent is closed, which is probably one of the more polite things that we've seen on uh, social media recently about um, the Kent perceptions around what's going to happen if we have lots of lorry drivers queuing for long periods of time. So, you know, um, you will recall that every time there is a a a, a, a piece on the media about um, Brexit, there is a lovely image of you know, the M20 as a car park. And those messages and uh, images are great fodder for 24 hour news media, but not so great if you're trying to market the destination. So, um, you know, there's there some of the barriers that we need to be addressing. So the most important thing that we can do, and, and one of the things we've been working very closely with partners with locating Kent, with uh, produced in Kent, and obviously with the Chamber and with uh, KCC, is around getting that message out that Kent is open for business and business in every sense of the way, whether that's investment, whether that is visitation, whether that is the day-to-day -day business operation um, of, of, of the business in Kent. This is really, really vital. And I think also that sense that we are that gateway to Europe, both, you know, that 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 that, um, that geographical position that we have and that relationship that we have across the Straits is really important. And as Mike Whiting mentioned earlier, the strong relationship with, that we have with our partners across the channel is really important, both in terms of can, keeping um, those uh, diplomatic relations going, but also whether it's tourism, whether it's uh, economic um, uh, business transactions to make sure that those relationships are still strong. And we were delighted to be part of the Straits Committee uh, working group on, on, on tourism, which is one of the leading parts of our economic development activity. I think the other thing that's, that's uh, you know, uh, going to be a really helpful message is very straightforwardly a check before you travel message. So I think there's a lot that we can do collectively to to nudge people, you know, so to to mitigate those 24 seven media images of Kent as a car park to be able to say, actually, you might want to give the M20 a, a wide berth, but there are other routes into Kent. And this is and if you're um, uh, an attraction. This is the easiest way as, as to how to get to us. And one of the benefits of working through COVID this year is we've had an awful lot of experience about being able to provide advice and guidance. And a lot of businesses are now communicating with their uh, customers uh, through their website. And lots of people have to book before they travel now in a way they didn't before. So it's a fantastic opportunity to be able to communicate with your visitor about how to get there in a way that's going to ensure um, easy access and a good day out. But the thing that I think we are struggling with as an industry more than anything at the moment, and Brexit's not going to help, is consumer confidence. We're uh, understandably incredibly nervous about traveling at the moment. Um, and this sort of stop start as the as the first and second wave come and go really, I think, um, makes people even more nervous. So when you're looking at stats as to when people will think they will be safe to travel and things will start to return to normal, you're looking way into next year. So what we have to do as a destination marketing organization and with partners is to get that message out whenever possible that it is this is how it's safe to travel. These are the procedures that have been put in place. So um, our priority with partners will be start and finish on consumer confidence, because the most important thing that we can do collectively to support an industry that's had a really, really tough year is to get footfall back, to get people back, feeling comfortable to visit and to spend. And the video that you're going to see shortly 
um, was the video that we that we um, launched in the summer to do precisely that. It's quite difficult to get the messaging on this right to make sure that people feel safe and secure to travel and that residents feel safe and secure when visitors come and visit. But we need to get that footfall going. I think we got it. We got it right. Um, but let's see what you think. Thank you. Deirdre, thank you very much indeed for that. Um, an awful lot going on. Um, just before we have your video, um, a couple of questions have come up um, and I don't see any of the speakers here, so they must have been sent in. And um, one of the first ones was um, with Dover being a nominated free port, is this a good or a bad thing for us? Deirdre, well, I think you're, yes. Uh Sorry, I, I think it's a terrific thing. I mean, um, I've had a number of meetings with uh, colleagues at Dover District Council, and I have to say the level of ambition that they've got um, is fantastic. Um, you know, if a, a successful, busy port that is a gateway to Europe, a gateway to the world, uh, is really important. One of the things that we would have been doing this year if um, uh, COVID hadn't put a stop to it is really working on the say pre and post um, cruise uh, business. And, and I'm sure colleagues on, on the call will remember that. And huge excitement when the uh, Scarlet Lady, the new Virgin um, uh, uh, Voyager um, cruiser arrived. It was just amazing. So I think anything that gives us an opportunity to be really uh, to lift the uh, business activity and the profile of our major gateways is is important. The most important thing, of course, is what you wrap around it. And as I say, that pre and post um, visit activity is is critical. OK, um, thank you for that. Anybody else want to come in? There was another question on inward investment. Um, are we actually, what are we actually putting out there as an in, as an, an investment and we offer the rest of the world? Um, again, most probably yours, but anybody else want to come in on that? Well, I don't know whether Gavin is on the call, but... I was, um, I was uh, looking uh, for him, no. Uh, I, if he's not, I, um, Gavin and I work very closely together and one of the things that we've been doing, again, in, uh, with, with Floorchit as well, is is trying to develop a communal message around that Kent is a good place to live, it's a good place to visit, it's a good place to study, it's a good place to invest, because I think particularly when you're looking at inward investment decisions, it's interesting to note that 19% of all inward investors started out as a tourist. Um, and if you think about it, quite often people will make relocation decisions based on that's a really nice place to raise a family and, and to have a good quality of life. And I think particularly now with maybe people work, working patterns being quite dif different, I think Kent's got a huge opportunity to be able to say, actually, you don't need to be right in the middle of London. We have the opportunity to be able to coax people out into um, a really beautiful county with lots to offer. Um, so that's why we're working collaboratively to be able to present that sort of destination message across a whole range of channel channels. Okay, fine. Thanks very much. I think that answers the question, and um, and Gavin would have um, answered in the same in the same way. There are no other questions at the moment um, been put forward. So bef I do believe Molly that we are going to go to Toby and have the video afterwards, or the video now. Uh, yeah, Deirdre, did you want to introduce the video at all? Yeah, I mean, I think um, why don't we do the video before we do the roads? <laughs> <laughs> oh. So yes, um, yeah, you've got it embedded, I think, yeah. Majestic cliffs serenely stand, crystal seas and painted skies. As footsteps trace on golden sand, a welcome sight for tired eyes. Hiking, biking, country lanes, Wide spaces open to explore, sweeping marshes, wild terrains. Respect, protect, enjoy them more. Cathedrals, castles, queens and kings. Legends born which time unveils. Peaceful pastime nature brings. The chalk draws along its winding trails. Beneath the beams of ancient oak, to eat, to drink, to share a tale. 
memories forge, senses awoke from hops and vines and Kentish ale. Twilight heralds fresh sunrises, waiting for the one that knows. Hidden gems yield rich surprises, where England's secret garden grows. So I hope you all enjoyed it. I mean, you will have noticed, the eagle-eyed among you will have noticed that uh, the, the punt in uh, Canterbury had some perspex screening on it. Everybody was very socially distanced or in their bubbles, all these things you've got to think about. And there's an awful lot of emphasis on wide open spaces. And um, you'll also heard the strapline, respect, protect, enjoy, which actually we've used a lot this year. It's, it's a countryside, um, uh, uh, country, uh, the countryside code. Um, which basically means that it's quite a flexible way of just basically saying, come, enjoy, protect yourself, look after yourself and look after our residents. So, um, yeah, that's all for me. Lovely. Thanks very much indeed for that little snippet there. I almost booked up straight away, but um, I've got to carry on with this uh, with this seminar. So thank you very much indeed for that contribution. Um, Toby, I believe that we have you online somewhere now. Toby, I can see you now. Yes, Toby. My apologies, um, my apologies okay. for the IT problems, but um, I'll endeavour to share my presentation now. Says he. <laughs> no problem at all. We've all had IT problems, I think, today. Hopefully that's now on your screen. It is. Great. OK, so after um, that lovely video of, of Kent, et cetera, and all of the tourists, but I'll bring everybody back down to earth now with um, the down and dirty in effect of what's being planned on the roads around Kent and for traffic management. So specifically, um, the Kent Resilience Forum planning, et cetera, working with government. So currently what we've got is there is a lot of trade and haulier engagement going on by government across loads of seminars, et cetera, to really get trader, traders ready for the end of transition. There is a haulier handbook that's been produced by government as well, and it's now being translated into many languages. A system which I'll go into a bit more detail later on for checking an HGV is ready to cross the channel has been tested and is being launched to all traders in a couple of weeks time. Across England, there are 45 information and advice sites. So such as Ashford truck stop around the corner from um, the, the Invicta location um, is for all the truck companies to be able to pick up information on what's required. And key to the plan, which I'll be showing you later on, Manston has been secured for six months until July to, to help us with the traffic management. There's a special development order process for various sites, which include Ebbsfleet, Manston, Sevington and Waterbrook. And there are statutory instruments which um, enable enforcement of all of this very close to approval. So just trying to work out why I can't change the next slide. There we go. So what we're going on at the moment is that we're working on refining traffic management plans. So one of the key things that Deirdre mentioned earlier was that the message we do not want to be putting out is that Kent is closed. So key to those traffic management plans is to make sure that what I'll be showing you later on is effective and allows Kent to operate business as usual as best as possible. So there is a compliance and enforcement plan which is key to all of that. And in addition to this, um, hot off the press is we are seeking temporary powers from the Department for Transport to enforce HGV parking in all of the East Kent districts, including Swale and Maidstone. This we already have partially within Ashford, but this will be a great relief to a lot of residents that are concerned about um, foreign HGVs, etc stopping in inappropriate places. So hopefully we will get confirmation that that will be available at the end of this week from the department. Um, Sevington, where I'm sitting at the moment, um, construction works are progressing and I'll show you a few photographs shortly. In addition as well, the, to the Operation Brock Plan, we're supporting all of the local hauliers in East Kent, including Faversham and Tenham. 
because what we don't want is for those, for example, somebody, a trader in Dover that's crossing the channel to have to go all the way back to the beginning of the traffic management up at Maidstone to come back to Dover. So we are issuing local haulier permits to all East Kent companies that um, have an O license to cross to Europe. So whether they've got one lorry or 30 lorries, they will get unique permits to enable them to go straight to ports. And of course, as been discussed COVID, we are ensuring that we have secure plans for every site at the moment. So to give you a bit of detail and a bit of meat to the bone, Sevington, as I say, where I'm sitting at the moment, is one of the inland border facilities that government are creating across the country near all of the ports. Um, KCC are working with the Department of Transport to get this site ready for the 1st of January. Um, for those of you unaware, it's right next to Junction 10A on the M20. So this was the site that was purchased by the department back in July. And the day after the purchase was approved, we were on site to start construction. So initially there was an entrance from one of the little rural roads, Church Road, but there is then a constructed site entrance being built from the main A2070 to the north. So in 20 weeks, this has been one amazing construction project. And where we are at the moment shows you to the left of that picture is Junction 10A. So you can see all of the tarmac that has been laid so far. And on the right hand side are buildings that are already going up as well. So they will be for HMRC inspection sheds. But key to this as well is that what we don't want is too horrific a blot on the landscape. So there is an awful lot of environmental work going on. As you can see adjacent to the church, there's a pond just in front of it and there's another one being constructed to the left of it. There will be earth buns created with huge planting in the spring to really minimize the impact on locals and also the view from the area of outstanding natural beauty up on Y Downs to really minimize that impact where possible. So a lot of care is going into this. Another view showing again more ponds and acoustic fencing that's being constructed adjacent to residences nearby. So again, key to that is to reduce the sound impact and also improve the environmental impact. This site has always been part of Ashford Borough's um, plan as an industrial site. So Junction 10A was originally constructed to support whatever was going to be built here. So I mentioned about check that an HGV is ready to cross the border. What I'll show you now is a two minute video of what traders, drivers, et cetera, need to do to ensure that they are ready to come into Kent and access the ports to cross over. So as I say, a very quick video, if I hit the right button at least. So they will be able to go onto the website on, as I say, mid-December, and start entering all of the relevant information. So this is assuming that this is a driver or a trader, and this can be done prior to journey, hopefully, so that they've got all of this information before they even arrive in Kent. So they go through all the relevant documentation of what they've got, what they're carrying, whether they have the relevant certificates, etc. And key to this is that they enter the registration plate because there will be checks based on their registration. There will be automatic number plate recognition cameras. And that shows that that was a green um, pass for the Kent Access Pass. So the fact that he's green and he's entered his or her registration an enforcement officer will then be able to, on their device, take a picture of that registration and it shows that that vehicle is ready and is compliant. However, if a driver then starts entering information or a trader starts entering the information and they are not ready, 
they'll carry on the same thing and it'll again prompt of what they are requiring. And with the Kent access permit, there is green, amber and red. So green you've already seen. This will be showing you a red, but in between that is amber. So they may have some of the information which will then show them amber. And they have anywhere in the country to stop at one of the inland border facilities to then complete their paperwork. So this shows that this was red and it is non-compliant. So that vehicle then, when the registration is scanned or where it is picked up on the automatic number plate recognition systems, will then be able to be stopped and an instant fine if they are trying to travel through the county. So the current traffic management plan, again, as I alluded to earlier, to try and mitigate any impact of all of this so that all of that freight, again, that was referred to that travel across the short straits will get to the port without too major an impact on Kent. So currently what happens is that freight heads down either the M2 and A2 or the M20 and A20 to Eurotunnel and Port of Dover. From January the 1st, there is the hope that there will be all of that trader readiness and they will continue on those routes. However, there will be these inland border facilities, such as the one here at Sevington and one at Ebbsfleet, where if they're, for example, amber, they will be able to update their information. But also there are some other checks that are carried out. Vehicles are regularly pulled over. There has to be a percentage by HMRC that have to be checked legally. So DVSA regularly pick up lorries that some may have seen on the motorways where they're escorted to a site. So they would be also escorted to these sites. If we then start to have problems at the port, the first thing is TAP 20. And this was installed many years ago on the approach to Dover on the A20. And unfortunately has been put in place quite a lot recently as the French have been testing their systems. For example, today there have been delays in that vicinity. So TAP is put on where lorries are queued outside of Dover so that again it doesn't impact the traffic and communities within Dover itself. This can hold up to 500 trucks and at the same time all freight will be directed via signs on the motorways to use the M20 and A20 to the ports. At the same time what is being put in place along what is known as Brock on the M20 between junctions eight and nine is a quick movable barrier. And that's already out on the hard shoulder along on the London bound carriageway ready to be put out. And rather than the metal barrier that was out for many months last year, this as its name implies is a quick movable barrier and it will be put out in place ready the weekend before the end of the year. And it, instead of taking six weeks to put out, it takes two nights to be put out. So one night will cone off in effect one lane, the next night it moves over so that we have two lanes of contraflow enabling traffic to continue to use the M20 while trucks heading for the ports use the coastbound lane. If we then have further delays at the port, either TAP is reaching capacity or also if freight is starting to back up as it queues for Eurotunnel, then Brock will be made active. And what happens then is there will be traffic signals for the freight heading to the ports on the M20, where they will be hold, held prior to Junction 9. Eurotunnel lorries will queue in the hard shoulder and Port of Dover traffic will queue in lane three. And there will be marshals there that as and when the Port of Dover or Eurotunnel require freight to be released because they have capacity, those traffic marshals will release the relevant lorries. And Brock M20 can hold up to 2,000 lorries. In addition to this, as well as Sevington being a border facility, at this time it will also, if required, be used to hold additional freight. So whereas currently we have a reasonable worst case scenario from government to hold possibly 7,000 lorries in the county with delays, this is part of that plan. So currently, as you can see already, we have the best part of 4,000 capacity. 
if that then increases and Brock and Sevington fill up, the next stage of the plan is to bring in Manston, where Port of Dover lorries will be sent along the Detling Hill, along the M2, down it way up to Manston, which has a capacity of up to 4,000. And again, then they will be sent down the A256, where there will be a brief holding point just north of Whitfield. So as you can see from those figures, we match the 7,000 reasonable worst case scenario. If it then were to exceed that, government national transportation plan needs to come into impact. As yet, we're waiting for the detail of that, but really, we will not want any more lorries to be coming into Kent, and we do not want to close Kent. So it is essential that there is a, a plan from government of what happens next, but hopefully, touch wood, we will never reach that point. In addition to that traffic management plan, we also have to possibly deal with prioritised freight. And this currently is Scottish seafood and day old chicks, which have to get to the continent to France within a very short space of time. So they cannot afford the time to be held in any of these queues. So they will meet at Ebb's fleet where they will be given a unique permit to then head down past the contraflow straight to the ports as required. Essential to all of this is compliance and enforcement. And the routes that I've just mentioned to you are shown in red on here. And with the special um, laws that are being brought in, the statutory instruments by government, when all of this is in operation, freight heading to the ports will only legally be allowed to use those red routes. If they stray from any of those routes and are detected, they can be pulled over by DVSA Kent Police and given an on-the-spot fine of £300. They will be taken to a safe place first where they will be fined. If that driver cannot pay that fine, that lorry will be impounded and clamped until the fine can be paid. And then there is an additional fee to release that clamp. So there will be huge publicity explaining this. And to begin with, any that are pulled over, again, there will be huge publicity saying, if you flout the laws, you will be stopped. And that what helps this is that the ferry companies and Eurotunnel will not allow anybody that is not border ready to cross. So again, that will be heavily publicised. And you will see on this map that at Junction 7 on the M20 and Junction 5 on the M2, there are ANPR cameras. This will be linked to Kent Police and DVSA so that if a vehicle that has not got the right Kent access permit passes those cameras, those registrations will be sent through to the enforcement agencies who will then be able to pull that lorry over. In addition, one of the key concerns, of course, is you know, the, the resource for Kent Police and DVSA is not um, infinite. They cannot be everywhere. We have over 8,000 miles of road in the county. So we've got to try and ensure again that we do not see any freight deciding to find rat runs across the county. So Kent County Council currently have CCTV cameras on many routes. And here's an example. This is the route from Manston down to Dover. And you can see where the cameras are and they will be monitored 24 seven to ensure that if we have any freight that is not following its guidance, if they are straying on any other roads, they will be picked up on those cameras and that information will be fed back to the enforcement agencies. In addition, we will be setting up a process for local communities, parishes, etc., to be able to notify us if they suddenly see um, lorries heading to the ports that are using the wrong routes. So what else are we doing? Um, of course, we're having to plan for multiple incidents. As has been mentioned, we've got COVID and also we're in winter. So we've got to prepare for all of those, making sure that we have um, plans in place that if we have bad winter, if we have COVID outbreaks at sites, et cetera, et cetera, all of that planning is happening. 
there is a cross directorate resilience group and directorate groups looking at all of the detail. There are business continuity plans for all the details as well. And we will be having sit reps tested through COVID. But what's going to happen for the next 30 days? There will be medical and welfare facilities on sites. We are constantly exercising all of the plans. There was a day long plan and exercise with loads of people involved from all um, society, from all emergency services, etc. yesterday. Communications are going to be key. That enforcement plan is key. And as I've mentioned, the quick movable barrier will be in place. And we will be standing up for response from the 28th of December. And that concludes um, my presentation. Richard, you're on mute. Okay, I'm hopefully now off mute. Thank you for that, Toby. Very comprehensive, very, very straightforward. Um, and if everybody complied with it, we shouldn't have any worries whatsoever. Um, I've got one, a couple of three questions um, for you. One's just come through. What happens to um, lorries throughout the rest of Kent? Because I think you mentioned that um, East Kent um, lorries can go, um, if cleared and on a green permit, directly to Dover. Um, but what happens to the rest of Kent? Do they get any um, priority? No, they won't, because the, ben the, the reason for the local haulier permit is those that, as I mentioned earlier, would have to go back on themselves before they can come forward. So generally those from West Kent and most of Mid Kent, their route would automatically take them to the back of that queue. So there's no additional reason then to give them that benefit. It's really to, you know, for environmental reasons as well as time, you know, that, that's why it's East Kent. I can completely understand that and, and totally agree with you. Um, perhaps the, um, the, the caller there didn't hear the earlier question. One that I have got for you is, um, and, and I do hold a, the portfolio for transport and infrastructure for the Chamber, is that we're looking after the motorways and everything else right now, but our biggest issue is always the A20, the A2s, where they all the roadworks that are going on. And I think of Selinge being one of them, mm. um, which has got to take an awful lot of traffic. Um, there's a lot of roadworks been done there now. They're now digging up the road again for gas or, or some other statutory services. Will we try and clear our main arterial routes outside of the motorway um, part for January the 1st, or will all those traffic lights and roadworks continue on our main artillery roads? With, with my um, day job as um, highway manager for KCC, we are putting an embargo on all of those key roads. So such as the A20 from, um, from Leeds through to Ashford, from through Selinge, et cetera so that there will be no planned utility or roadworks on any of those routes to, to enable um, businesses and communities to still operate. However, there may still be emergencies. So in other words, if you use your, lose your electricity supply and the electricity board have got to come and dig it up as an emergency, they will be allowed. But we have put embargoes through loads of roads in those vicinities to stop any planned works during this period. Excellent. That's 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 good. Very very good news. I can assure you. Certainly for me, and most probably for Tudor as well on the A20. Um, but one of the other the other questions that, that we had um, was concerning. Um, oh, I've forgotten what it was, or I've gone past it now. I've turned over too many pages. Um, but ensuring that um, that that we get. I mean, the number of all of the publicity that's gone out there you would have thought that we would be ready for it. But the Freight Haulage Association have been saying over the last month that we're not ready, we have no information, and yet just complying with the information you've given us, theoretically, we should all be ready. What is your view on how many people are physically ready for this? The, the good news is that there is a lot of positive news also coming from traders. 
there are a lot of doom mongers out there that will be going, yes, we're doomed, it's ruined, nothing's planned, etc. But we are getting feedback, positive feedback as well. There are a lot of um, seminars going on to traders in the UK, but also in France and other parts of Europe, where there is an impression that trader readiness is more. The trouble is there's been a lot of Chinese whispers. So there have been rumors that, oh, actually, it's going to be extended. It's not going to happen on the 31st. We don't need to do anything yet. So, you know, all of these things. So you always get the Chinese whispers and the doubters that leave everything to the last minute. But I think the key that will help is um, once the ferry companies have said that they will not allow freight on board if they're not trader ready, whereas before the ferry companies wanted to ensure they had fr full ferries. So if they um, if freight turned up at the ports, they let them on, whereas now they will not. And that really is going to help. Okay, are you still with me? I seem to, I think we've um, slightly lost you there. Uh, Tudor, can you still hear me? Uh, I can, yeah, although the signal for some reason is breaking up no. on your side. Tudor, could you take over in case it's me that's lost here? It's on my side. Okay, well, I'm going offline and we'll come back on. Um, could you, Tudor, take yes, over of for course. one minute? Yeah, no problem. Obviously, I think uh, you, we can all hear Richard, but he can't hear us, so that's fine. Uh, Toby, thank you. That was um, uh, really quite encouraging, I suppose, is, is probably the right way, which uh, is, is a probably a, a terrible underestimate of all the hard work that you put in uh, so far. Um, one of the things that uh, I guess there are some commercial truck stops here in Kent, um, you know, what consideration is being given to, to their commerciality and their potential loss of business if we're parking lorries up, you know, uh, at sort of um, so the, the inland border posts and places like that. Any, any sort of consideration being given there? The, there is a difference of how they operate because the intention for these inland border facilities is that they're purely for customs checks. Mm. Yes, part of the traffic management plan will be to hold them if, if necessary, but for facilities such as showers, restaurants that, for example, Ashford Truck Stop has, mm. these sites will not have those as permanent facilities. So any trucks that are coming through that will be bored already that wouldn't need to stop here may well still use Stop 24, Truck Stop, etc. for their rest, and that will not change. Excellent. Um, there's a question here in from Robert. There as part of the education process for EU HGV drivers, can something be done to stop these drivers from dangerous practices? Um, it, it goes back to the enforcement question. Obviously, um, there's a lot of enforcement making sure that the trucks coming into into Kent are um, are going to be compliant. Uh, what about the other way around in terms of trucks arriving from the EU? Have, have we got any sort of plans to try and tighten up on some of those those issues and transgressions? Um, yes, again, I mean, the enforcement is key to this, and there's always the argument that foreign lorries don't get pulled over, they don't get stopped, but we do get assurances from DVSA and Kent Police mm. that they will be enforcing things, so hopefully that will happen. That's great, that's good to see. And the, the question from Ellen uh, around, uh, can you confirm when the new IT system will be released? I think this is referring to the the how to um, check an HGV is ready, as I say, will be available to companies. I think the date that they've given is about the 14th, but we've said mid-December. Mid-December, that's great. Thank you. Richard, it looks like you're back online. I'm going to hand back to you. <laughs> Thanks very much. Yes, I am back online and I and I do hope that um, I'm not repeating a, a question here in as much as um, Toby, um, we're all aware of the weather situation that we've got at the moment. We're all aware that you're sitting there in your wellies, most probably. So seeing as you're on the spot, how close are we to actually having um, Sevington ready on January the 1st? And secondly, um, is everybody aware that you do have a backup facility being here on Waterbrook? Yes, Sevington will be open on the 1st of January. As you say, if we have rainfall for the next month, we need a contingency. So yes, Sevington is that contingency. So there is the possibility that we would have to split facilities initially um, with maybe HMRC being at, Seving at Waterbrook and the rest being at 
Sevington. But there are, funnily enough, there are discussions going on with government departments on site at the moment, looking at that contingency. But hopefully, um, we wouldn't need Waterbrook, but it is a contingency plan. Okay, how are we doing on other questions? Any more come in, Molly, at all? I haven't seen any more on the bottom, but perhaps I could just ask one question, which seeing as you are on the spot again, the entrance that's being constructed on the uh, Sevington Lane end, I presume that's for um, staff entrance and not having to go to Junction 10? Yes, there are two, and the all freight will only come in off the A27. But yes, there is a staff car park that's right down next to Church Road. That entrance is being surfaced as we speak so that staff on the site will come and go that way so as not to conflict the trucks coming in off the 2017. I, I will say that, yes, that would be in tarmac as I came past there um, a couple of three hours ago. Uh, Tudor. Um, yeah, Richard, just picking up, there's a question coming from uh, Meinolf Klöping. Um, how will LGVs be directed to the port? Uh, in terms of signage, Toby, I think you may have covered some of it, but what, are, what others are signage? Because obviously we've got multilingual issues. There will be main signs actually onto on the motorways to get into the site. And when they leave, there will be direction signing out back to the motorway at Junction 10A. Plus there will be marshals that have got wonderful packs of multilingual um, responses, etc. All they need to use is their, their lovely translate system on iPhones now, hopefully. But, but yes, there will be signing. That's great. And uh, one other question. I think Graham Card had a question if there was time. Graham, did you want to come in and ask that verbally? Yes. You know, I was uh, wondering whether it might take me too long to type it. Um, thanks, Tudor, and thanks, Richard, and, and thanks, Toby, for a, a very interesting presentation. Um, the, uh, referring back to the map that you showed us, uh, Manston, with its 4,000 uh, parking capacity, um, there was no mention of HMRC there unless I missed it. Um, the reason I ask is because uh, about a year and a half or so ago, I had the opportunity to have a bit of a guided tour of Manston when it was being set up as a uh, as a customs facility with a bus service for drivers and all sorts of stuff. Um, and I realised that perhaps uh, Junction 10A may have um, replaced that thinking. But I just wondered if you could just give us a little bit more um, in terms of what Manston will do, or will it just be physically a lorry park? No, Manston will become a temporary inland border facility. Sorry, I didn't make that clear. Mm. So for the Port of Dover traffic that will be directed there as opposed to Sevington, there will be temporary facilities with HMRC, etc. Same kind of customs checks. Um, there is a new site being planned adjacent to Dover that will be ready for July for imports. So that's why Manston is only temporary until that stage. Okay, thank you. Okay, any more questions there um, that we've got? I, I don't see any come up on the chat. Any been sent in, Molly, that um, we can go to? No, but I think that is all the questions answered. Thank you. Toby, I'm seeing as that um, you've got to get out of that um, very wet and soggy site at the moment. Um, I, it's one question that perhaps you could answer just since we've got a little bit of time you have mentioned a couple of times of the landscaping that's going on there you have mentioned that yes i agree this has been a dedicated commercial site for ashford borough council for some considerable time what you are doing there strikes me as being possibly a little longer than 12 months to uh, two years um it's, I mean, it is a, no disrespect, it is an ideal place, and I speak for the Chamber, it is an ideal place for what it's being used for and for our emergency. We've already got the truck stop there and, and everything else. So is this a continual process, do you think, or do you see us in two years' time down the line not requiring this inland um, port? The, the inland border facility here at Sevington is planned for five years at the moment. So um, that's, that's what the current time frame that DEFRA and HMRC have said that they will require a site. So hopefully um, Waterbrook will only be needed, if at all, for a very, very short period and will then become the extended Ashford truck stop. 
Yeah, I under, fully understand that and under quite au fait with, with that actually happening. I was, wasn't quite sure on the two or the five year part of that, um, but certainly are supporting it. I don't think we can do anything else to support this apart from telling people, no disrespect to them, but get their finger out and get this actually in operation and, um, and get their their carnets and everything else that they need ready. We did watch on the television, I think it was last night, with a, a very worried, I think he was a Belgium driver, scratching his head in Calais and saying, I don't really know what I am supposed to be doing. Pretty good English, but still said yes. he didn't know. Are the same um, publicity and all of the criteria going on in Calais and Dunkirk as they are um, here? In, yes, uh, it is. And in fact, again, as was mentioned on the previous discussion, there is a really good relationship with the local French at the moment. Yeah. So we are working very closely with Calais, with Dunkirk and with Eurotunnel because they don't want all the congestion. They don't want all the problems either. So um, they are communicating just as much over there. Yeah. OK, well, that's great to hear. And, and I must um, must say that's that's pretty good news. Um, and perhaps the problem is with the press, they pick up the one little bit uh, and they run with it. Unfortunately, not interviewing the other 10,000 that have um, that have yes. actually got it all in pan. I will say it's nice to know that we've got a, 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 the um, parks for all of these lorries. Um, remembering that there's over 10,000 a day now coming through both. So it, we get full up pretty quick. And um, But Toby, I do thank you um, for your presentation. I'm wondering whether there will be an availability of that um, presentation that you've done, because I do believe that it should go out to um, various other um, EDGs, economic development groups that we have running. And it would be very good to get this information out. We get blamed for not um, for not getting the information out. When people like yourself have worked hard to get this amount of information out, it's worth us making sure that everybody is aware of it. So, Toby, I thank you very much indeed. There are no other questions. And it's what I would like to just say to everybody is thank you very much for being here.